too, Madison and Mason mostly. And how at the very end, at the very end, Mason said, uh, it's good, but not good enough. Sorry, Jim, I'm not gonna sign on. And some of you know this probably, but Madison, what? See, you wrote most of the damn thing, you gotta sign on. He said, no, I'm not signing on because it's incomplete. And Madison said, what do you mean? He said, it's gotta have a bill of rights. Now, here's the deal. If you assure me that you'll do everything you can to help those of us who are trying to get a Bill of Rights ratified by the rest of the states, then I won't make a big stick out of this, and it'll go through. And Madison said, all right, you have my word. Now, in those days, people kept their word, okay? And the, the Constitution was approved, and Madison, to his great credit, did all he could to get those people riding up and down the eastern seaboard on their horses, getting people to ratify the, 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 ten, uh, the, the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments. And when I look at what's been happening to that Bill of Rights, I'm talking Amendment 1, Amendment 4, and what we've just been discussing, Amendment 5, you know, no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, or, or property without due process. Well, hello? How can you have someone who's prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner, police? I mean, that doesn't square. It doesn't align, not only with, it doesn't align with American values and certainly not with legal values. And yet, I haven't heard a lot of, uh, a lot of dissent or a lot of protest coming from the legal profession. And that's to me a real quandary because my dad was a professor of law for his whole life and I'm sure he's rolling over at his grave. And I'm sure that George Mason and James Madison are also rolling over there in their grave to see how our Constitution has been shredded. Now, uh, what do we do about all this? Well, I have a couple ideas. Um, yeah, there's just one other thing I wanted to mention and that is that uh, we all know about the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, which was uh, fixed up so that the president is now authorized to call in the army uh, to arrest any of us. Again, police, prosecutor, judge, jury, <laughs> and executioner. Or in this case, probably not execution. They just send us to Guantanamo. But, but not forever, just till there are no more terrorists in the world. <laughs> you know, when I heard what was going on uh, and saw the president sneakily signing this thing while we were all having our martinis on, on New Year's Eve, I said, holy Moses, what have we become? How did it happen? Well, I thought originally that it was Joe Lieberman, John McCain, and Lindsey Graham who kind of thought that they shoved this down Carl Levin's throat, okay? Well, it wasn't so. Carl Levin revealed, in, in responding to an objection like this, he said, look, he said, when we sent this bill over to the White House, it didn't include American citizens. When we got it back from the White House, it did. Well, two things wrong with that, folks. <laughs> Since when does the Senate have to accept wording from the White House? Number two, why did they, why did they just accede to it? So, when it happened, I'm thinking, wow, not since after the Civil War, when, uh, when Posse Comitatus was introduced, a law which pr prohibited the, the sheriffs in the South from using the U.S. Army in an internal security function, okay? 140 years ago, I think, okay? Not since then has the Army ever been allowed an internal security function. So, so why? Why would, why would they do this? And you know what? The best I can figure out, this is all speculation. What I've said up until now is pure fact. <laughs> uh, what I think is that they're afraid of us. What I think is that they're afraid that uh, maybe this spring or next spring or maybe this fall, uh, Congress and the White House will be surrounded by 80,000 of us. Uh, the Levins and Lindsey Grahams of this world will not be able to go home to their Georgetown penthouses for their martinis. And who are they going to call to wrap?
for so long. Now, the park police, not the park police. We have a very good relationship with the park police, okay? I think they're beginning to feel that they're part of the 99,000, 90, 90%. How about, oh, yeah, there's the Capitol Police. Capitol Police aren't real good at much other than to, you know, make sure you, you go through those uh, detectors. Um, how about the DC Police? Well, that's surely part of the 99% and they're beginning to think that. Ah, I know, the Secret Service. <laughs> Likely as not, they're down in Cartagena somewhere, but I moved up, so. And besides, even if they're all on duty, there aren't enough of the Secret Service. So if you're really afraid, if you're really afraid that you're gonna need somebody to come in there and arrest a lot of us, put us away, round us up, you're gonna need somebody really dependable, some, some young people who take orders reflexively, and corrupt generals which is what we've got, ordering them to wrap us all up. Now, that is my best guess as to why they wanted to be sure they could use the U.S. Army. There's one other thing that's related to what we've said already, and that is that by coincidence, Carl Levin, well, Carl Levin has received more money from APAC-related institutions than any other senator or representative in history. And that's partly because his tenure has been so long, but it still speaks volumes. Lindsey Graham, John McCain, Joe Lieberman, what do they all share together? All four of them. They're incredibly pro-Israeli, and they're, they very much like to see a, a strike in Iran. Now, if Netanyahu and I believe that Netanyahu has the initiative here. If Netanyahu decides that he's going to strike at, at Iran, and some of our kin, or some of the people we know, go over and try to scale the, the cliffs on the Strait of Hormuz and, and try to, try to, you know, in as best a way as we can with what troops we have left, um, subdue the Iranians? My goodness, it, it boggles the mind, I thought. But you know what? That could happen. And I think that these same four are very conscious of that. They realize that the backlash, if you want to see a backlash against Israel, that's going to be what happens if this, this goes through. They want to be prepared to deal with the backlash and make sure that nothing untoward happens to them. Again, that's speculation, but you know, somebody tell me a better explanation and I'll accept it. Let me just wind up by saying that uh, I think there are things that we, we need to do and can do. Um, first off, I think we need to spread the word. Uh, we need to make sure that our friends and neighbors and our family know what's going on. I'm reminded of uh, something that uh, uh, Dr. King said in a wonderful letter from the Birmingham City Jail. He talked about injustice and how it needed to be exposed. And this is what he said, I think I've got it down. Quote, like a boil that can never be healed as long as it's covered up, but must be opened in all its pus flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. So too injustice must be revealed with all the political tension its revelation causes to the air of national opinion and the light of human conscience before it can be cured. That's our role, folks. I've already established that you guys know as much as, as any audience I've ever addressed over the last year or two. And uh, when we know about injustice, I think we need to uh, be willing and able to uh, to put our, well, to stick our necks out. Now, I've been accused of having something against necks. <laughs> really, yeah. yeah. Um, necks are, are a nice thing. I like them. They're a convenient connection between head and torso. <laughs> I need to be without one, but if there's nothing for which you will risk your neck, then it's become your idol. And necks are not worthy of idol worship. 
And so I think, as Dr. King suggested earlier on, that it is a time to put our bodies into it. We have to be willing to engage in a physical kind of way, nonviolent, I would suggest, but very, very telling in, in how we address these things. Um, some of you, no doubt, have been arrested already. Some of you not. Um, the last time I was arrested when Hillary Clinton didn't like me standing with my back to her, and I was brutalized by those uh, those cops. Uh, somebody said to me a couple days later, "Ah, oh, Ray, you, you, you might, must be used to it by now." And you know what? You never get used to it. I've got something I'd like to share with you from one of my prophet uh, people, uh, Daniel Berrigan. Hey, Ray. Yeah. I really, really hate to say anything, but we probably have an hour or two of questions to do in 15 minutes. Oh, I'm okay. Well, let, me, let me just wind it up now and just say that uh, <laughs> I take a lot of encouragement from Daniel Berrigan, who uh, has been there, done that, has owned up to the fact that uh, you know uh, he's never felt comfortable being arrested because he doesn't do good in jail, as he put it. Uh, and, uh, and none of us probably do very well in jail, except for those few times when we're all together. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's my, my plea to you, really. Um, just as uh, Tom Paine identified the uh, winter and, and summer soldiers, uh, we're going to need winter soldiers this summer. And I hope that uh, the rest of you will think about it and think what George, Ma George Mason and, and James Madison would have us do in these very critical circumstances where the Constitution of the United States is being shredded. Last thing I'll say is this. Some of you, no doubt, were in the Army, Air Force, Navy, whatever. Uh, and like me, you swore a solemn oath to defend, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's the way the oath reads, okay? Now, um, that oath has no expiration date. And I am, in a major quandary now as to what that oath requires me to do. And I'm not alone. There are a whole bunch of former army officers that I'm in touch with who are puzzling through this. We don't know what we're called to do, but we do know that we're not called to sit around and do nothing. So those of you who have had similar oaths or those of you who feel as strongly as we do about this constitution, uh, let us uh, let us see you in action. Uh, let us see you stick your necks out. Uh, easy for me to say, but it's not really so difficult to do. Thanks very much. I'd love to have questions. because of our history of imperialism. I heard a lecture at the Miller Center where a Harvard uh, graduate student was saying, we're not an empire, we're going to be an umpire. Umpire, yeah. Well, I don't know about PTSD, but uh, certainly the empire trappings are part of this whole thing. Uh, when I mentioned uh, at our hearing, John Conyers, that uh, the objective here on the part of Israel and the United States to make sure that we dominated that part of the world. Oh, God. All the, all the representatives from heavily Jewish districts, you know, just reamed me out with an hour after it was all over. And so did Howard Dean came back with the office and said, McGovern is anti-Semitic, this kind of thing. But, you know, you have to say it. And um, the, the Jewish Voices for Peace, and many, many really, really good Jews that I know are, are plugging away against this thing. And we can't be bashful about all this. We just have to speak out. Next, yes, please. Yeah, Ray, you said at one point that uh, even if the Iranians scraped up one or two nuclear weapons, they could be deterred by the Israelis' possession of some hundred nuclear weapons. Then you went on to say later that if the Iranians could have a nuclear weapon, it would be the Israelis' cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, it, it, I try to distinguish, you know, a, a little pause, <laughs> okay? It would give them a little pause that they don't have to worry about now. Now, I, I like to quote Jacques Chirac, who spoke very openly about when he was asked, he was asked at an open venue here, Herald Tribune, New York Times, and uh, Le Monde. They asked him, do you think that if the uh, Iranians got a nuclear weapon, they would uh, fire it at, at uh, I mean, yeah, fire it at Israel? And Chirac said, oh, mon Dieu, he said, if they did, it'd get 200 meters in the air, and Tehran would be flattened. Give me, he doesn't give me a break, but in French he said that, all right? Now, he had a recant that. It was on tape. Two days later, he disavowed having said that. What am I saying? I'm saying that the Iranians aren't, aren't suicidal. But if they had a nuclear weapon, and it was a marginal thing like they, they found out that Israel wanted to attack Hezbollah again or clean out uh, southern Lebanon, then uh, uh, if the Iranians said, well, you know, really ought to think twice about that, the Israelis would have to think twice. Would they go ahead and do it? I think I said before, yeah, I think they go ahead and do it. But nobody likes to worry about something coming in their back door, even, you know, even if it would require a suicidal person. That's what I meant. This coalition in Israel a hopeful sign or not? I'm, I'm sorry? The coalition, uh, the, the yeah. widening the base. Of the... You know, I don't know. I've been trying to piece that together. Um, it should give him more freedom of action, and yet some of the people in this coalition are, are more chary of some of these adventurous policies. So I just don't know how it's going to cut. I'm no expert on Israeli politics. Yes, in the middle. Um, what if you speak about how ground war in Iran would, would fare as far as the United States and who would engage Iran in that ground war? I mean, we haven't really, I mean, with Iraq, we, mm. we had sanctions yeah. against them for over a decade. Yeah. We were pounding them left and right. Yeah. And, and well, we, just, we don't have that with Iran. Yeah. So. Well, ground wars are passe. We don't do ground wars now. We have these planes which do the wars first. Okay? Some of them don't even have pilots, so nobody gets killed. It's a great, great, great thing, except it never wins a war. I remember in Vietnam, LBJ came to us, CIA, and said, hey, these blue-suited generals, uh, they're telling me that they got this new airplane called a Bay 52, and it's got this great big bomb. They want to seal off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and Ho Chi Minh won't give up. What do you guys think? And we could hardly suppress a laugh, but we waited a decent interval, two days, and came back and said, now, Mr. Mr. President, number one, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail doesn't look anything like uh, I-66 or I-95, you know? It's something quite different. And number two, Ho Chi Minh's not going to give up. We know Ho Chi Minh. We brought him into Hanoi when the Japanese had to leave, okay? He's not going to give up. Nobody gives up on the bombing, okay? And so, if you're not going to put ground troops in because you don't have any, how are you going to conquer or subdue a, a nation of 80 million people as powerful and as talented as Iran? They don't want to subjugate them, they just want to do a lot of damage uh, so that uh, they'll set back uh, what they perceive to be their nuclear program, and uh, that's, you know, that would be a big win for them. Yes, please. Uh, kind of two questions. The first part of it is, do you see the U.S. hand behind the Arab Spring? And Do I see what? The U.S. hand behind the Arab Spring. And also, what effect would an attack on Iran have uh, in Syria and the other countries? Mm. Yeah. Well, less first. I think Syria is the focus of uh, a lot of attention now because if we could do a Libya operation against Syria, then Iran would be deprived of one of its major friends, okay? First party thing, no, I don't think the West had anything to do with uh, the uh, popular uprising in Paris this spring in, uh, in Egypt. Matter of fact, as you recall, uh, Hillary Clinton and, and the president postponed wishy-washy, oh no, we want, we want stability, and oh, well, it looks like, well, no, we want, you know. So they were against it. It took it by surprise. I'm sure it took everybody by surprise. But uh, no, they're not. And that, that's the thing I forgot to mention, to mention briefly. Israel has had a very bad hair year, okay? Egypt, 80 million people. Last year, subservient, calmed down, restricted, 
Now, not only free, but you've got Muslims dominating the, the parliament. You've got the gas cut off, the natural gas, and you've got people saying, we're going to fling open the doors to Gaza. Real stuff. We've got people in Egypt saying, we care about the Palestinians. Knock it off. 80 million people. How many Israelis? What, 7 million? Something like that? North. Turkey is really still very ticked off about, you know, for some reason, I don't like to have the citizens uh, massacred by the, by the commandos on, on, uh, in the Israeli Navy. And so they lost Turkey. And, and Iran, well, Iran used to be a very close ally of Israel. Did you know that? Before the Shah's fell, they used, to, they used to have very close relations. So they don't do that. So if you look at, in, in the UN, Israel is, is isolated in a way it's never been isolated before, in my view. And that is, is, could be bad as well as good because, uh, you know, what Netanyahu needs to prove now, I'm trying to get into his mind, is that, yeah, he's isolated, but he's still got the best friend anybody could possibly have, and that's the United States of America. And how does he demonstrate that? By starting a little hostility with Iran and having us jump in with both feet. And when I say both feet, I mean with our wonderful Air Force and drones and all that kind of stuff, not with ground troops, so that we can print. Yes, somebody back there. Yeah, I hate to look backwards instead of forwards, but I was wondering if you were aware, or I'd like to make you aware of the work of Dr. Chris Busby, who went to Fallujah to study the depleted uranium contam contamination in the soil and in the people, and what he found was enriched uranium. And yeah, this is in Iran. This is in Iraq. In, in Iraq. In Fallujah. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't know where else besides weapons that enriched uranium would come from mm -hmm. in Fallujah. Yeah. So I think we have some kind of nuclear weapons that are in use by our military currently. In Iraq. In Iran. In Fallujah, he said. In Fallujah? In Fallujah. Uh, the, the scientist's name from England is Dr. Christopher Busby. Okay, I'll look it up. Thanks. Anybody else? We got about three more minutes, is that right? Yeah. That is correct. <laughs> okay, yes, please. Yeah, nobody else has a question. Uh, it's been a long time in the intelligence community. Uh, but we seem to have great faith in uh, the fact that Leanna Panetta doesn't think the Iranian nuclear weapons program is presumably based on his intelligence. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the good news, okay? Well, what, I, what I normally start off with sometimes is pointing out that there are two CIAs, okay? There's the one that Harry Truman set up to give him honest intelligence on what was going on in the world. A, an institution not under the, the Pentagon, who always saw the, the Russians as 12 feet tall, or under the State Department, which was always defending his policy. An independent place where he could go and say, Mr. Director, come down here this afternoon at 2, two o'clock. I want to know what you and those two universities worth of specialists you have out there in the woods of Virginia, what you really think about this subject. I know what Pentagon's saying, I know what this is. I want to know what you think and be able to expect a straight answer. Now, if you were president, wouldn't you like to have that capability? Yeah. Now, guess what? After I had just about given up and was able to throw, willing to throw the baby up with the bathwater, I won't talk about the other CIA, you know what that's been doing, okay? That was an accident of history and the bad mistake was to put them together. Now, the place. The place that Truman, uh, that Truman intended, where I worked for 27 years plus, uh, after the debacle where George W. Bush had, well, the word really is uh, prostituted for the intelligence. Don't let anybody tell you that was mistaken intelligence. It was fraudulent intelligence. The head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, when he released a five-year study report, a bipartisan report, said, the intelligence used to justify the war in Iraq was uncorroborated, contradicted, or even non-existent. 